Welcome to another episode of Angels, Positivity, and Love. We have an incredible guest coming to us from Sedona. Normally, she's in Scottsdale, Arizona. She has one of the most incredible backgrounds. She's lived an extraordinary life. She stayed true to her inner self and trusted her path. And she believes in angels, the spiritual world, and much more. I am so happy to have with us physician to the president from 1994 to 2001 under President Bill Clinton, which is about the highest, most distinguished office a doctor can have. She's an MD, an FACP. Um, it's Dr. Eleanor Mariano, but people call her Dr. Connie. She's got a book out. She's been the White House doctor. Uh, she's been on tons of different shows out there, tons of media. She's been around the block, knows her stuff, and she's got incredible energy. Dr. Connie, welcome to the APL show. Thanks. It's wonderful to be on with you. Well, I'm super excited to have you. You are like totally sensitive and totally present. You do a good, lot of good for people, obviously in the medical community, but beyond that, can you share with us some of your background? Where do you hail from? When did you first feel so connected to life, the universe, what was around you, within you, your family? How do you roll? My, my parents are from the Philippines, were from the Philippines. My dad joined the Navy. Uh, in the 1940s, I have most of the men in, in his family were, were were Navy enlisted servicemen. And so I was born on a Navy base in 1955. My first name is really Eleanor. I was named after Ele uh, the wife of an admiral. Eleanor uh, Goodwin was Vice Admiral Goodwin's wife. She wanted to be my godmother, but because we're a Catholic and she was Episcopal, they couldn't do that. So I moved to the United States when I was two in Honolulu, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. And I look back and I think the first time there was something different about me was when I was about five. We we're in naval housing. And in those days, my little I have a younger sister who's three years younger, Lori. And my dad would come home from work and he'd put her on his lap and he'd watch TV and he would have her sip his beer. And she sort of got used to sipping beer. So one day we had visitors at the house and my three-year-old sister was in the, um, she was in a playpen and my aunt took her out and didn't watch her. So my sister wandered out, toddled out to the backyard near the parking lot. And my dad was in the back parking lot, simonizing liquid wax, the car. And the phone rang and they yelled for my dad to come inside. So he puts down the wax on the floor beside the car and answers the phone. Meanwhile, my little three-year-old sister wanders out. She sees the canister of liquid wax and assumes it's a beer, which dad feeds her. And she drank it. And I happened to pond her on my bicycle and she was on the ground, unconscious. And I called my parents and they freaked out. Everybody freaked out. They threw my, my brother, my sister, my little sister, my parents, and by the way, talk about angels. My dad's first name was Angel, Angel, and my brother is Angel Jr. So I grew up with angels to begin with. I was supposed to be a boy named Angel Jr., but I came out to be the girl. So we go up to Tripler Army Hospital in a panic. My, bro my dad's in the waiting room holding my brother, crying because he felt so guilty. My mother brings me in to meet the physician. I'm six, six years old. My sister's three. She's unconscious. She's lying on the table with my mother, who can't speak English very well. And my mother's trying to explain what happened. And all of a sudden, my sister has a seizure. Now I'm six, and I see the seizure. And the doctor says, oh, she's got epilepsy. We need to give her medicine for the epilepsy. And I said to my mother, hearing this, mommy, tell him about the poison she drank. And he says, my goodness, what happened? And she looks down and she's so embarrassed. She says, I'm so sorry, doctor, but my husband left out some cleanser and she drank that. And he's, the doctor's like, oh my gosh, we have to treat her differently. We have to pump her stomach. We don't need to give her, I assume was dilantic. Now, why would I know at the age of six what a seizure was and that you had to pump your stomach for giving, you know, anti-epileptics? I didn't know any of that. So there's those little funny things that, that happen. But I think in a lot of ways it formed me because early on it was, do you really trust them? It's, do you trust your parents? 
So I'm sort of hypervigilant. So I became the caregiver. That's why I went into medicine. Am I the caregiver? I'll take care of you, but I'm also the interpreter. I'm the voice for people who are afraid to ask or, or speak up. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. So there's always these things that go on. And, and the other time I recall when I interviewed at the White House, and I, it was a very intimidating, intimidating interview by Dr. J. Burton Lee III, who was physician of the president of George Herbert Walker Bush, and he was very gruff with me. Um, but before I went in to be interviewed, they asked uh, for my resume, and the doctor introducing me said they forgot it in the other building, and Bert Lee threw a book against the wall and just says, never mind, I'll make the decision without it, send her in. And I heard that as I wait in the waiting room. And before I went in, I stood up, I said a very silent prayer. I asked for help. And what I prayed was this, dear God, show me a sign. And I think from then on, I've seen signs. So I walked into the, the office of Bert Lee. And as soon as I walked in, I saw the sign. And what it was, Michael, was a single tan bandaid right across his forehead. And I thought, oh, he's human. He can bleed. And so shook my hand. We did the interview. A year and a half later, I had his job and I was there for nine years. So you can't make that stuff up. You know, people say maybe you're lucky. If it's the hand of God, if it's the hand of spirit, you're blessed. You got picked for that. And for the audience, uh, you retired as a rear admiral. Uh, I think there's two classes. So the lower class, if I've got that right, in the Navy. Uh, and you still have a practice that you've started um, Center for Executive Medicine in Scottsdale, Arizona. You're the president and the founder, um, still very active in the medical community mm -hmm. now. Yep, um, still and, see patients. <laughs> yes, very distinguished. I mean, that position alone was uh, very special. You can't tell anybody about any of it, but at one point you were in Scottsdale with the Mayo Clinic originally, mm -hmm. uh, and then you started your own. So I think that was around 2001 and then 2005. Again, you mm -hmm. started your practice. Um, tell us a little bit more about you went to, I believe you got a, a bachelor's of arts in biology, and then you went on to medical school and stuff like that through the Navy. Tell us a little bit about more about the healing journey, how you decided to become a doctor, or at least the path itself. Were there little moments of synchronicity in like medical school that mm -hmm. um, were just incredible for you? You know, I, I struggled with school. Um, well, first of all, I, I was in the beginning, I was trying to be the overachiever. You always keep, you know, you always work really hard. But I decided to become a doctor when I was in junior high in Taipei. My dad was stationed in Taiwan. And we had a Navy doctor come over and speak to his school, the classmates of mine, about what it was like to be a physician to deliver babies. And I thought, I'll, I'll go to med school. I want to be an OBGYN doctor because my father, his story was his mother died giving birth to their eighth baby, her eighth baby. So he lost his mother when he was quite young. And that really impacted his whole life. So I was went to med school thinking I'd go into OBGYN. And I rotated in my third year through GYN, OBGYN at Bethesda Naval Hospital in the old days. And they were so mean to me. There was one particular resident who was so obnoxious in those days, verbally abusive, bullied me. I thought, I don't want to be one of these guys. This is not what I want to do. So the next month, I rotated through internal medicine at Walter Reed Army Center. And they were the nicest people. And I said, I want to be one of those guys. So I go and become an internist, go on, you know, internal medicine, get chosen, go to the White House, 24 years active duty. Fast forward, it's it's about 30 years after graduating from med school. And I always think of karma. I get invited to be the guest speaker at the American College of Gynecologic Surgeons in Tucson. And on that day, there's a, a dinner that night honoring me. And I look across the table. And there's a guy who 20 some years ago bullied me as a resident. And I said, well, Dr. So-and-so, did you train at Bethesda? He says, I did. I said, I think you were my resident. So I'm gonna mention you in my remarks tomorrow. And so the next day, there are about 500 people in the auditorium. I get up, they introduce me, all the doctors. I said, I want you to know I started off my career. I wanted to be one of you all. I wanted to be an, I wanted to be an OBGYN. But one of your members convinced me in med school that was not the right path. So I owe it to him to thank him because if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't be here on stage. So did my talk, 
nice standing ovation. As I was getting ready to leave the building, he was standing at the carport waiting for me. And he said, I'm so very sorry. Was I a jerk? I said, yes, you are horrible. He says, I so apologize. He said, you're very fortunate because I turned lemons into lemonade. In fact, I turned them into margaritas. And I was blessed to have found a path. But don't you have to remember it's how you treat people. It's how you treat them. And don't, don't eat your young. Don't kill your young. Because one act can impact so many people. And I look at that in my life. Your interaction can impact us in so many ways. You don't meet people by accident. There's a reason they come into your life. That's this interview. You popped up. And on a day, I was getting an email from my medium, Michelle Claire. And you had just talked to her that day. And then, you know, Molly, I was thinking about Molly, what was going on with her. So there are no accidents. For the right? audience, I had reached out to Canyon Ranch, which is an amazing like five-star resort, Arizona, but all over the world. It's got a lot of properties. And they pay attention to spirituality. They have spas, but they don't just do, you know, golf, ho fancy hotels, fancy establishments for dining. They take not just acupuncture seriously, they take wellness, holistic approaches to stuff and spirituality seriously. So they've had spiritual directors for a long time. Jonathan Ellersby uh, was one of theirs uh, from like 10, 15 years ago, gave me a testimonial. Um, and I had reached out to Canyon Ranch to talk to them. And one of their very senior long, been there a long time, decades, I believe, had suggested you as a guest on the show and immediately was like, I have the person, let me get in touch. I said, sure. And then I was talking with Michelle Claire in Gilbert, Arizona, incredible psychic medium. She was already a guest last year in one of the early shows. I'm going to guess like episode nine. She's been on a panel. I have mind, body, spirit panels for the audience. Check those out. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment. But Michelle is going to be back within an episode or two of yours. Here's Connie. You're watching this Dr. Connie right now on January 28th of 2024, episode, I think 56. And within one or two episodes of you is Michelle Claire back on. She has had three near-death experiences and she's crystal clear. I don't think her last name's an accident at all. Claire, C-L-A-R-E. Um, she's fantastic at what you do. Put yourself in her hand. She gives good advice and listens on your behalf. So it got really weird because I already had an appointment with her that day that you reached out to her to just, hey, do you know this guy? And mm -hmm. the crazy amount of overlap that was happening, serendipitous, how about that? It's the angel network. Exactly. Okay. Have you, do you, do angels exist? This is a question we ask every fourth show. Mm -hmm. Do they yeah. exist? Yes. Have you had a Absolutely. time in an, in an OR or uh, I think I'm using lingo correctly at a hospital or somewhere where you felt the presence gotten a little extra advice or it's come in as intuition mm -hmm. and you're like, Ooh, we should go this direction. Yeah. Yeah. In my medical practice, there are several incidences where Somebody will say something. Uh, I, I still remember it clearly to this day. About 10 years ago, this lady came in for an annual exam. She was about 68. And I was going over her, you know, mammogram, blood work, EKG. And I said, well, you know, we should get a chest x-ray. And she goes, why do I need a chest x-ray? I don't smoke. I said, do you ever smoke? She said, oh, well, high school. That was, you know, 50 years ago. I said, I said, just humor me. There's a x-ray unit across the street. I just, you know, we have belly fever here in Arizona. I just... Let's, let's just get an x-ray. Something said, get an x-ray. We got an x-ray that, that day. The radiologist called me. She had stage three lung cancer. Now, how do I know that? How do I know that? So we found it. She had radiation. She had chemo. She lived long enough to see her two daughters get married uh, to their boyfriends. And then at the end of her life, about six years later, she had five grandchildren. She was able to look into their faces. So you just... Angels whisper, they don't shout. It's that little whisper, that little tug that says, maybe I should do this. Well, let's do this. I'll, uh, let's, what have you learned on your path first that you think applies to everybody else? Because everyone's somewhere on this unique life path of theirs in the universe. I always say loves the fabric of the universe. I got that from angels. The very little that I say that's original. But what advice do you have about staying the course or giving yourself a break to discover what that unique life path is. How can we trust more, love more, allow more, worry a little bit less? I, I believe you come into this life for a reason. I was taught by my late husband that, you know, he believed that your soul picked this life. 
And part of our journey is what is my sole purpose? What is my mission? What am I meant to do in this life? Who am I meant to touch in some way? Once you find your purpose, you can live life fully. And then you ask your angels, you ask your guides to just guide you along. I, I believe my late husband is one of my angels up there. Back one of my mediums says, oh, he just showed me his wings. He had massive wings. He was an overachiever. So I'm sure he's he's up there. He, he looks out for me, protects me. There are times I'm driving and I could have had an accident and I got I swerved away and I, I didn't get hurt. He I, I would fall and not get hurt. And I said, that was you. You 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 saved me from getting hurt. There's no accident there. Mm. He was looking out for me. Okay. And you have a particular uh, affiliation or you you affinity. I don't know what the right word is here, but you like to help widows. You have an event mm -hmm. coming up at Canyon Ranch, I believe, in May of 2024. Um, can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? Obviously, you've had that experience yourself. And how do you how do you talk about this when you help others? You know, I always believe that may my pain be somebody's gain. Why am I going through this? And the most painful, most difficult experience of my whole life has been to be a widow, to lose my husband suddenly at age 63. He crash landed his glider during the Nationals competition, sailplane competition in Nephi, Utah. I was waiting on the runway, waiting for him. And I just had a feeling as I kept waiting for him that something happened and as all the planes were coming back in the back of the mind, I can hear myself making a list of the people I would call to tell them the news. There was something there. I remember the last time I saw him, we had this, this, this little ritual as the, sail, as the tow plane would come to pick up his glider as they hooked the, the nose of the sail plane to the tow plane and they take it down the runway so they can lift it to about 2,000 feet. I would check the canopy. I would be the one to close the canopy. I would pat him on the back. I would check his oxygen, his um, his um, his uh, parachute. And as our ritual, as a, the tow plane, plane was coming to get him, I would always say, come back home safe to me. And I would kiss him on the lips and he would say, I promise. That was always what we did. I would close the hatch, secure it, and then pull aside and watch them tow him away. But this time, the only time, January, January, July 1st, 2019, rather than look at me and wave and blow a kiss, he looked straight ahead, dead ahead. And I was surprised by that. So they towed him off. I watched till he was up in the air. And as I was driving away in the truck to leave the airport, because I had to go do some errands, I looked at the glider trailers and their long trailers where you, you fold up the, the gliders when you transport them, long trailers with a fin that had the tail numbers. And what struck me as I looked at the fins, the tails that had their call signs, his was five Mike Mike, FMM. What struck me was they look like tombstones. I said, why do they look like tombstones? There was always like that feeling there, that uneasiness. So when that happened, I came back, he didn't come back. The um, contest director said, you know, that's unusual. Let me call the sheriff. And as soon as that happened, he called the sheriff and they were talking. But as soon as he said, you know, they, they think they found his plane. And the contest director started to cry. And he said, you know, they found the plane. There are two bodies. There are no survivors. And the first thing I said was, I have to make some phone calls. And so you go into autopilot. And that happened in July 1st, 2019. And then COVID hit. So are all these things, but throughout it, I, I had dreamt about John several times. And the first memory, the first dream I had, which they say is a visitation, was a month after he died. And he, in that dream, I am flying one of our airplanes. He had a turboprop. And I was in his seat. He, I usually sit beside him in the, in the cockpit. And he looks at me in the most brilliant blue eyes. And he says, no matter what happens, no matter how rough it gets, you keep flying the plane. To me, it said, you keep working. Don't give up. Keep doing what you're meant to do. Don't quit. You keep flying the plane. And I just, I, I, I get these messages since he died. I have a little folder that I write as kisses from heaven. These little things like numbers and music that would come on and that you can't make that up, that he would send to me to reassure me he's okay. And then I have, 
medium friends who would connect him and it would reaffirm that he's okay. He's joyful and he died when he needed to go to pass in the most beautiful way. And he's always with me. Mm. And I think if people believe that there's life after death, there are angels, there are spirit, and it's a beautiful place, I think they won't fear death. I mean, right now, my aunt in California is dying. She's 87. Her 90-year-old husband died a month ago. And so she's transitioning. And I feel peace and prayer for her and everyone around her. But it becomes a beautiful transition. And so if you give them hope, it makes them think about how they treat everybody in this life, right? How do you treat other souls around you? And you treat them in a very treasured way. It changes your outlook on life. Beautiful. That was a lot of sharing and incredible. Um, we just met today, even though we had been set up maybe earlier in the week, I didn't even know we were going to cross paths. So I feel extremely fortunate for this. Is there a way to describe us meeting before we started taping that you would want to share? I, I tend to do this for all the guests uh, in the last year, the 50 episodes, uh, meet them either way in advance, the before the show, sometimes after the show, and give them an opportunity to explore their own abilities to let go, connect to the universe. Is there anything you'd want to share about before the show when we connected earlier? You know, it's interesting. You said where you live, and I said, I'm going to that town to do a conference. And so we're meeting for dinner. So yes. why, why did you February. be, yeah, that living in that town on, on leap day, you know, on a leap year, why am I winding up in your town of all the places I go? So we're going to meet in person. And then I look behind you at your flag for your father, you know, uh, as an aviator, as in the military. I mean, he was a Navy, a Navy pilot. You know, I, those guys are amazing. And you grew up where I grew up in, in Washington, D.C. There's a lot of connectedness. I look at your sunflowers, and I always believe the sunflower is the widow's flower. I look around you, and, and the session you did with the angels, your energy, Michael, is, is intense and bright. You channel a lot of that. You are the angel channeler. You know, you're the whisperer, but you are more the channeler. You are actually, you know, earth angel. Uh, somebody said, you know, you're, you're one of the earth angels coming around, right? The messenger. I try. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's easy. It's hard. It's whatever you want to allow for it. And what people will allow for, if I had one message to the audience right now, no matter who you're listening to out there, what you're seeing, whether it's my show, another show, it comes down to what will you allow for in each moment. So you can be mm -hmm. up here judging fear, reacting, stress, worry, knowledge to the preclusion of possibility, or you can be down here. Scariest place in the world for most of us. I'm borrowing from Peaceful Warrior, that gymnastics movie mm -hmm. by Dan Millman. Love it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's it. And if you could talk to us about, you are clearly an inner fearless, peaceful warrior. You've been staying the course. It doesn't mean you don't have the dark night moment or you've got mm -hmm. the walls closing in or at least some turbulence from time to time. Mm -hmm. But how do you describe staying the course? It comes naturally to you, but it's still a decision. Again, it's how you treat people. Well, let's talk about how you treat yourself. The self-love you show yourself. Mm -hmm. Talk to us more about that uh, inner fiber, that loving fiber that you've got running through you. I'm surrounded by wonderful friends. I have the most amazing friends. I surround myself with energetic friends who are humble and kind and creative. I'm really blessed to have two wonderful sons and grandchildren and their wives and but it's really my friends because you choose them or they fall into your circuit and then you keep them close. And the ones who I meet, you know, we have a lot of acquaintances, but we have only very few true friends and their energy keeps me going because they give to me as much as I give to them. But they teach me to be a brighter star, a brighter light. And I think when you're humble about your experience and that you say you failed or you're sad or you're alone or you're depressed, you're ready to give up. You acknowledge your humanity, and that's when people want to help you, right? And you know, you know very well, this is a very dark time in our world, in our life, in our country. People are so divided. They're fighting. They're angry. And we're the other channel to bring people joy and hope and healing. We're the other way to get people out of this. Hmm. And that's where uh, even the thing that you think that you disagree with or resist how do I do this? There's stuff that's going on up in the mind. You're not going to like the New York Jets, but you're going to love the Los Angeles Chargers or the Rams. We'll mm -hmm. do the Rams this year because they've they're in the playoffs. Okay, mm -hmm. for at least another week or so. Um, 
it's bigger than that. And if you could just give yourself a little bit of breathing space, everything sorts itself out. It's love. Mm -hmm. Love is the fabric of the universe. Love mm -hmm. is all there is. Can you give mm -hmm. us, I'm going to blow some sage in a second to you. I do this for every guest mm -hmm. through two screens. So it'll reach you in Sedona, Arizona. We did it before the show, so we know it works. But can you give us a final reminder about love and how shiny it is, infinite, it's in you and around you. And you know, you have that connection with people. There's a sizzle. You know, I look at all my patients. I follow some pretty amazing people. I'm their private physician. And for many of them, I'm the one who signs their death certificate, death certificate. And I'm there at end of lot. And in the end, it isn't how famous you are, or how many cars you have, how many houses, how many jets how wealthy, it's your sense of love, who's with you, whose hand you're holding. It's how deeply you are loved and how well you loved others. It really is in the end, how will you be judged? It's how well did you love? It's It really is about love. Mm. Okay, I'm lighting some sage. That was the ball out of the mm -hmm. park and the leather knocked off the ball. Okay. So I've got a mm -hmm. red-tailed hawk feather. I've got some sage. I'm going to pull out a good old American Bic lighter and light it. And what can you allow for? A lot more than what we typically allow for. So whether it's angels, you don't have to actually see photos of angels. Go to my website if you want. You don't have to see them in human form. You don't have to come them, have them come to you in a vision. Just... Get out of your own way and let them do their jobs. They'll do most of the work for you. You have to get out of your own way and put it to the universe, whatever we're talking about, career, health, relationships, or just more inner peace. Here's a little bit of sage. I'm going to blow it Connie's way, Dr. Connie's way. If you can catch sage out there for the audience, but maybe ask for flowers. This is the point. Why settle for the linear when you can go bigger? I'm not saying more is better. I'm just saying positivity is abundance. So ask for flowers and sage, ask for your favorite ocean smell. You haven't smelled it in five years. You're in Noosa Beach, Australia, but you miss Thailand. Ask for that Thailand beach smell. And Dr. Connie, what are you getting in Sedona right now? I'm getting juniper. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a little cedar juniper. that snuck in here, but I don't have yeah. any juniper. So you're doing good. You're burning in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. People can replay that. Um, it's also in all the other shows. I even have like little videos to help a person let go. It doesn't matter if you're watching this in 2026, 2030. Time and space aren't what we think. Have you learned it isn't quite what we always, the brain says it's always a certain way. People walk in a room and you're like, oh boy, I've got to help this person. Then you get over it and you roll your sleeves up, even if you're not wearing short sleeves already, and your compassion kicks in. You are a tremendous carrier of compassion for people. And uh, can we hear you define compassion a little bit? There's a million definitions, but what's the Dr. Connie patented method of compassion, how you approach people again, even though you probably already said it earlier? You really feel their pain. You are there. You feel it. You do. You Ooh. feel their pain. Okay. I'll put photos for three angels, Audrey Hepburn, then you can pick someone. Don't share anything. Share something. For folks at home, they can put their hand up and feel a vibration through two screens, if I said that right. Your screen, my screen, we all scream for angels. Mm -hmm. um, here's joy, the emotion joy. And ask a simple question. What is the audience? I mean, she might know a little topic. You're like, oh, I forgot to mention this. What do we all need a reminder on? Joy? Yeah. It's her name. We need to embrace it. And then Charlotte's everybody's favorite school teacher from childhood with words meant to help you expand. What's Charlotte have for a reminder for us or just get something private and get a hug? Mm. You're prof playing professional psychic medium now, so don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. What does she have for us? Just learn your lessons. <laughs> 
And finally, uh, Min, my guardian angel, it's a silhouette of an angel. She's light waves of energy in the ocean. Now, Dr. Connie grew up in Hawaii, um, Oahu, if I've got that right. Uh, mm -hmm. And here's Min. You can catch that favorite beach of yours from childhood or hibiscus in the air if you wish. Have her bring you a little bit of ocean smell or sunflowers, your call, or both. She say, go with flow. Just go with the flow. Cool. And if I gave you uh, Mother Teresa, is that cool? Or is there another figure that we could do? If you want to name one more figure, I've got Mother Teresa here. Is she okay? Yes. Oh, okay. absolutely. Here's yeah. Mother Teresa. She's got oh. a sparkly sense of humor. What does she say? Compassion is not dependent on any one person's happiness. Mm -hmm. And she also says, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. And I love mm -hmm. that as a reminder today. It's beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. To get loving and get going with your heart. Yes. 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 And then what yes. does she have for us all as a reminder? Remember, you're the professional psychic right now helping us all out. It says, take care of each other. She is a caregiver. She took care of kids. Bring me your kids. Uh, will you tell yeah. us, Dr. Connie, to get a little serious again about your uh, the White House doctor book? Uh, it came out, was it? Uh, 20, 2010. 2010. 2010. Okay. Uh, St. Martin's Press. It actually has been optioned twice in Hollywood. Optioned to CBS in 2019. And then COVID hit and everything got quiet. And then a couple of years ago, A&E optioned it. Uh, so now it's the screenwriter who would do the series would be uh, would be a TV series. would be is Bill Harper, who did Grey's Anatomy. But it's quiet right now. So I, I, I have a couple of ideas for television series I need to pitch to pitch the Hollywood people. I've got things to do. I've got the book to write on widowhood about that widow's walk journey. Uh, I look at statistics, 700,000 new widows every year, 11.8 million widows in this country. 72% of married women will be widows. And as I say, it's the club that a lot of us never wanted to join, never planned to join, but there we are. And most women outlive their husbands by 11 years. So it's, it's, it's the journey from we to me. And the question is, who's me when you're when your husband's not here? So it's a big journey. And I, I need to write that as for my healing. And then it's the uh, television series that I want to work on because that's that's the joyful. That's my creative fun part. That's the that makes me laugh and makes me create. Well, that's beautiful. And I would just do a reminder for folks. You're never alone. You're surrounded by angels. They come in all shapes, sizes, colors. They have all sorts of backgrounds and many missions, missions, specialties. Um, one angel would be good enough to get anything done from our perspective. We think they're perfect and all knowing and they are from our perspective, but they're still learning from us. They're in and around us. I'm trying to regurgitate everything I've learned in 12 years. Um, they're super fun, tons of humor. You're not getting judged. Just lots of love and compassion. And when it comes to your relatives who have passed over, your loved ones, they're with you as well. There's a little period right after they die that there's sort of an orientation thing and a mm -hmm. review or a reconciliation phase so they can get cleaned up, so to speak, so they can be their shiny best. And sometimes like my parents, both parents, one passed over when I was turning 23, my dad, the Navy fighter pilot you mentioned, 1970, um, they show in their 20s to people, which I just think is beautiful. They're very sparkly and fun and easy to relate to. So a message to everybody, you're it's never quite what you think it is. And as dire as the brain's going to tell you, your heart is already there. And mm -hmm. I have to thank Dr. Connie right now. You are just such a light for us all in the way you talk, the maturity and the hope that you give us with how you handle yourself. Do you have a final message or two for people? Uh, again, whether they've lost a loved one or they're just, again, on their unique life path, um, what's a final reminder for us all? Our loved ones are never gone. They're always with us in our heart. But every day is your opportunity to grow and be closer to the source. Be open. Be open to things. My late husband used to say, I thought you were a woman of science. Why do you believe all this? I said, <laughs> there are things beyond and above science that connect us. And in the afterlife, he has said, you are so right about this. It's about energy. And it's the most beautiful and abundant thing. So when times are down, look within, you know, you'll find the source. And it really is, as you say, it's the essence is love. It really is. The essence is love. Mm. 
Okay, I'm impressed. I'm blown away. Thank you very much, Dr. Connie, for being on the show. This is Dr. Eleanor Connie in quotes, um, Mariano, and that's MD, FACP, but physician to the president. This is the United States president from 1994 to 2001. It was President Bill or William Clinton. Um, one of the most distinguished positions a doctor can hold in the United States of America. But you were also in the Navy and you got your education that way through the ranks and retired as a rear admiral. Um, I, I believe there's, again, two versions. So thank you no, as an author, a speaker. You do circuits. Uh, you do address people pretty often. And again, you have a practice in Scottsdale, Arizona that you founded in, um, I think, again, it was 2004. Four, five, five. five. Yeah. The Center for Executive uh, Medicine, and you're the president and founder. Thank you for what you do for people. You're definitely an inspiration. You have a Canyon Ranch event coming up for wind widows in May of 2024. How can a person find out more about that? Why should they be coming to that event? If I'm a widow, a woman somewhere who's lost my husband or loved one, why? Am, how am I coming to the event? What can I expect? Can you take 30 seconds on that? Mm-hmm. We're, we're formulating it to be a widow's wellness weekend to address, I think, up to 35 women. For, they may have been recently widowed or widowed a long time ago, but it's to look at it from a perspective as a physician in, in terms of grief and bereavement and sorrow, but also as an individual who has been through it in my own personal way. It's a very individual story, but we provide the support in terms of how to heal, how to grow. Uh, we they will also offer psychics, mediums, uh, astrologers, all their their spirit guides to help. I think it really helps. And a lot of it, too, is working in a group with other women who have lost their husbands. And I think, you know, as they say, misery loves company. You have plenty of company. <laughs> it's just sharing that. And we won't be alone because our husbands will be with us there. They just won't, won't be checking in for the room, but they'll be there in spirit. But it's very healing. When you look at the population of women who've lost their husbands, I think it'll be an opportunity to reach out and help them that they're not alone and that they can come through it stronger, better, more beautiful, more in love than ever, that there is life after death. Mm. Again, what a wonderful reminder for us all. Thank you very much, Dr. Connie, for being on Angels, Positivity, and Love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for all you do.